Yes, it's not often people put enlightenment and leadership together in the same sentence. Um, I guess the oldest definition of leadership, the kind of cliché definition is there's only one way to lead and that's by example. And, uh, and so the consciousness of the leader is the consciousness that, that someone's always watching, someone's always watching me. So am I being a good example for others? Now, in a more formal context of an organization, then most managers are expected to be effective leaders. But actually, in reality, you find that most managers are actually not such good leaders because they don't have this consciousness that they have to be a good example for others. In fact, the manager's mindset tends to be, and it tends to have been learned over the past couple of hundred years, that you're the manager, so you have to control your people, coordinate your people, organize your people. In other words, you have to make people do what you want. And, and this impulse to control others, which is, of course is driven by, oh, got to get the job done, we've got to hit the target, we've got to achieve the objective. It's kind of driven by a fear-based tension. It is what stops the manager from being aware that their attitudes, their behavior, their relationships, the way they relate, uh, is actually how they lead others by example. So it's quite clear the difference between a manager and a leader in a formal context, at least in an organization. So you know the, the old saying, manager is a position, leadership is an attitude. A yeah, manager might appear on your business card, but leader only appears in the minds of others when they decide to follow you. And you can't make someone follow you. This is the great mistake of most managers. They expect people to follow, and if they don't, they try to make people follow them. Whereas the enlightened leader realizes you can't make anyone do anything. You can't control anyone in terms of their behavior, their thoughts, their intentions, everything, really. And the enlightened leader knows that. And so the enlightened leader stops trying to control others and they learn to influence and they know the primary mode of influence is not controlling but being an example first, showing others the right way to be, the right way to interact, the right way to relate, ways in which we get things done together. So wow, manager, I guess, manager's mindset is more nine to five. It's more kind of, I just come and be a manager in the workplace. But the leader's mindset is always 24 seven, simply because they're aware there's always someone watching. So every day, the enlightened leader has three tasks, essentially three tasks. I mean, leadership can be boiled down into three tasks. It's a little bit simplistic, but it, it, it gives us a foundation. Sometimes in, in seminars, we, we, we get into this whole um, very profound question of what's the purpose of life? And the purpose of life is something that we're doing all the time. We cannot not do it. And if you're aware of what you're doing all the time, you are thinking, therefore you are creating. So fundamentally the purpose of life is, well, I don't come to get a life, I come to create my life. Now, in a sense, we're all leaders because we're all being examples for others. So both in an informal and a formal sense, each one of us has to create three things every day. Not outside, not in terms of artistic creation, but within our consciousness. There's three things we have to create and refresh every day. Vision, decisions, and precision. When I say vision, I mean a vision of how things are going to unfold into my life in the future. And for a leader in a formal context is, do they have a clear vision of how they and their team or their organization is going to unfold in the future? Is there a clear picture which they can articulate to bring others with them? And in the context of our personal lives, what is it that I see unfolding in my life? Do I have a sense of that? 
Yeah? And, and so I create that. But most of us, we don't do that creation. We let someone else do that for us. And we're kind of led by the influences of the world. The second thing every day we have to create is our decisions. Some small decisions, some life-changing decisions. But we're creating decisions all the time. But what's the quality of those decisions? What's the accuracy of those decisions? And so the second aspect is our decision-making. The third creative aspect is precision. When I say precision, I mean how am I communicating with those around me? In a formal context, it's my team, my colleagues. How precise, how accurate is the way I'm relating, communicating? But that generally is the same for all of us. How precise, how accurate am I connecting with others? Am I uh, sharing with others? Am I involving others? Am I bringing others with me? So this is the precision of my relating to others. So these three things, vision, decision, precision, in essence, are what the enlightened leader has to create and refresh every day. Um, but then that gives rise to the question, what do I need in order to be creative? And essentially, what we're using in our creative process is something called intelligence. And so the quality of my creation is going to be dependent on the quality of my intelligence. And that's why you've seen in the past five, ten years, an explosion of books, both about leadership and about intelligence. And essentially there's four levels of intelligence that we bring to our creation of our vision, decisions, and our precision. Rational intelligence is the obvious one, where we think things through, we think our way to a decision, but it takes time, a bit noisy, and it's quite tiring in the brain. And that's why a few years ago, someone came along and said, why don't we use the intelligence uh, that women have and men don't to make our decisions, otherwise known as intuition. And you could go on a course and you could learn to make decisions using not your thoughts, but your feelings. I feel this is the right way to do I feel this is the right thing to do. I feel this is what has to happen. And so most of us don't know the difference between our thoughts and our feelings. But if you ask most successful entrepreneurs, business people, inventors, even scientists, they'll tell you their best decisions were made intuitively, usually in the bath. Why? Because that's where we're very relaxed. And that's where we relax our minds a little bit. And all the thinking, the noisy monkey mind, and that's when we can hear the subtle voice of our feelings, our intuition, our innate wisdom begins to speak to us. But then, of course, the other level of intelligence that has become very popular in the past 10 years is this thing called emotional intelligence. And, and of course, emotional intelligence is quite different from rational intelligence in that someone with rational intelligence is usually the person who's very academic, very brainy. You give them chalk and a blackboard, they'll talk all day long, the most complex formula. But if you take them and stand them six inches from another human being, they cannot do it because their emotions are triggered and they're out of control, they say the wrong thing, and they're not sensitive to the emotions of the other person. So they have very high IQ, rational intelligence, but very low EQ, emotional intelligence. And we see today that most major organizations, where before they wanted the clever people to come in and become the leaders and the managers, they don't want the brainy people now. They want the people who have emotional intelligence, the people who get on with people, the people who can build relationships, who can connect and influence those around them. Why? Because technology says if you don't like where you work, just take your computer, sit it on your kitchen table, and you can have a global business in three hours. And we could never do that before in history. And more and more people are doing that. They've been leaving their organization to start their own entrepreneurial activity. Why? Because when someone leaves the organization, they don't usually leave the company, they leave their manager. 
don't like him, don't get on with him, had enough, I'm going to do my thing. So now most organizations, they want people who know how to build relationships with people to keep the talent in the organization. And that's why EQ has become quite prominent in a formal context of a corporation. But the deepest level of intelligence is kind of coming over the hill now. The cavalry is on its way and it's called SQ. And this is spiritual intelligence. And spiritual intelligence is that little voice in our head. And it whispers sometimes. It says, why am I doing this? What am I doing here? Actually, what am I doing here? And this is the voice that's telling me I've not yet learned to make meaning in my life. Every human being is a maker of meaningfulness, but no one teaches us how to make meaning out of whatever is going on around me. And so spiritual intelligence is the ability to make meaningfulness. And as an enlightened leader, I know that's the deepest motivator for every human being. Because when we're doing something meaningful, we're very enthusiastic. The energy pours from inside out into what we're doing. But when it's not meaningful, we don't really care. We don't really give it our best shot. So the enlightened leader's job is to help people find meaning in what they do. And, and someone with spiritual intelligence, essentially it's not about beliefs and dogmas and religion. It's just the ability to be stable with whatever is going on around you. In other words, someone with spiritual intelligence will never be surprised. They'll never be shocked by anything, <laughs> which is quite challenging for most of us who are easily surprised, easily shocked. Oh my God, what's happening? What's going on? And we get into an uh, emotionally reactive mode, which means we've lost our spiritual intelligence. So it's these levels of intelligence that we draw on and bring to bear in the creation each day the refreshment each day of the vision where are we going what are we trying to do what are we trying to achieve of the decisions that we make what do we need to do to get there who needs to do what what resources do we need and of the precision of our communication with each other it's those levels of intelligence that we need to reactivate in our consciousness to be more enlightened as a leader. <laughs>